Welcome everyone and thank you for coming to spend some time with us. Today's topic is recognizing urinary tract disease in this time of COVID. Our speaker today is Dr. Jody Lulich. Dr. Lulich received his DVM from the University of Minnesota where he also did his PhD internship in small animal rotating and also did his residency in internal medicine co-director of the Minnesota Urolith Center at the University of Minnesota, and is a professor in veterinary clinical sciences there. Dr. Lulich is an expert in small animal nephrology and urology, or kidney and ur urinary tract health. He is specifically interested in disease biomarker research and the crystal lattice microstructure of uroliths, or animal urinary stones. He has received many awards, among them Speaker of the Year at North American Veterinary Conference and the World Small Animal Veterinary Association Award for Excellence in Veterinary Healthcare. We welcome Dr. Lulich. Hi, everyone. I'm glad that you can join us today. I'm going to hopefully give a, a good seminar that'll tell us how to make things a little bit easier and a little bit more efficient. Taking a pet to the vet has created new challenges today. We always want to ask ourselves, is it safe? Is it necessary? And can I wait? But what is the best way to communicate to my veterinarian? I will share several tips to make this pandemic easier to manage. The tips are also good to continue even when we return to normal. So you need to know what diseases are common. This is because during these times, veterinarians may need to treat in the face of uncertainty. So what diseases are common? Well, for the dog, three diseases are really common. Urinary tract infection, bladder stones, and urinary incontinence. And you know, these diseases vary based on the gender and the age of the dog. For example, urinary tract infections are very common in female dogs, but they're rare in male dogs. Now the opposite is urinary incontinence is common in older female dogs, but rarely happens in male dogs. Bladder stones happen in both males and females, but female dogs often develop infection induced struvite earlier in life and later in life, male dogs develop bladder stones like calcium oxalate. But what diseases are common in the cat? Well, the most common disease is idiopathic cystitis. Well, this is good news and bad news. The good news is, is that it usually resolves by itself in about seven days, regardless of what we do. The bad news is that it's likely to recur and we don't really know the underlying cause. But there's more good news. As cats get older, this disease tends to go away. One of the most important diseases for us to recognize are urethral obstruction. It happens in about 20 to 30% of our patients. And it's an emergency, a life-threatening emergency. So it's something that can't wait. Bladder stones happen in about 15 to 20% of our, our cats. The good news is about 50% of them are due to struvite, which means we can dissolve them without surgery using medicine and diet. One important thing to realize is urinary tract infection is not very common in the cat. Uh, however, it's a, the most common therapy given to cats with lower urinary tract disease. Um, it's okay to give it, just realize that it's probably not the cause of cats showing clinical signs. What I really want to do is talk about what supplies do we need, not only for your patients, but also for the shelters and clinics. What I'd like to do is put some of this in the hands of our pet owners or pet parents, because they can really help us out tremendously and make the process very efficient. These five things are essential, what I always tell my clients. You need to have a smartphone, a ladle to collect urine if you're collecting urine from a dog. Um, urine strips are easy to, to get, not only online, but also easy to read. Um, some of the things to keep us safe will be little disposable pipettes or little cylindrical containers, as well as, this, as, well as little disposable tubes. And lastly, I'd like you to think about an, a motion-activated camera. It'll help us differentiate um, which animal has the problem, and also give us an idea of really what's going on. Um, with that um, uh, smartphone, what you really wanna do is take a movie or also take a picture. So when you're talking about urinary tract disease, you also wanna take a picture of where the urine is and also the size of the puddle. Let me show you what I mean. 
I'm going to show you now a movie of a dog who's um, urinating. Right away, you get lots of information. You know this dog gets blood in its urine. And because it's not straining, it's not a lower urinary tract problem. So we need to look at other places. Let's look at another case. This bulldog's owner is concerned because this dog has recurrent urinary tract infections. And the reason why this owner is calling me is because he thinks his dog has another infection because when he walks it, it urinates multiple times. I asked him to take a movie. Look at the behavior of this dog. It certainly doesn't look like it has urgency, but it's doing something quite typical. It sniffs the ground and then urinates in that spot. So although this is a female dog, it's actually marking its territory. And when you walk dogs, especially in new environments, they may mark their territory several times. And lastly, I just want to show you what an ure uh, urethral obstruction looks like. You can see this dog straining. You can see there's the tip of his penis and nothing is coming out. So that's an emergency. We really need to get those patients to um, uh, have uh, proper medical care in a very quick time. Now let's talk about some of the abnormalities that can happen in urine. So blood in the urine is one of the most common abnormalities with any urinary tract disease. Sometimes it's visible and sometimes it's not. I guess that's an advantage for me living in a place that snows at least um, half of the year is that when it snows, owners can pick up blood right away. All of these samples that you see on the screen have blood in them. In two of them, it's very obvious. In the others, blood was not detected until it was tested. So how do we test for blood in the urine? Well, it's really simple. I get my clients to buy dipsticks and tell them to dip it in the urine. And then the wonderful thing is they can read it right away. Um, you probably know that in that middle of that dipstick is where blood is. And so I have to tell my clients some very important things. And that is there are some things that are really reliable on the dipstick and some things that are not reliable at all. So I have to train them to not look at the leukocytes because it's not gonna tell you whether or not you have an infection or not. It's not sensitive in the dog and it gives you a false positive in almost every cat. Every cat always has positive for leukocytes. Nitrate, which tells you about bacteria in the urine also cannot be looked at for the dog. Remember these urine dipsticks are designed for people. They're not designed for animals and animals are a little bit different. The other thing that's not reliable is the specific gravity. So don't look at that on the dipstick. Well, now that I've introduced you to some of the supplies and some of the tests, let's look at some of the applications. Application one is going to be, is the blood coming from the bladder, the vagina, or the rectum? Let's take a, move, let's take a look at a movie one of my clients sent me. This is quite an interesting movie because it looks like part of the urine doesn't have blood in it and the other part has blood in it. Um, that raises lots of questions for me. Um, what I wanna know is, is the blood coming out at the beginning of urination or in the end of urination or is it coming from the urinary tract at all? What I'm gonna ask my owner do, to do is collect a midstream sample or at least take another video. So if they got lowered to the ground and actually showed me where and when that blood is um, coming out, then I'll know exactly what to examine. Well, they really couldn't do that because the dog gets really low. So I said, go out there and, and get a, a soup ladle and then um, collect a midstream urine sample. So you're gonna let the beginning go on the ground and you're not gonna sit there and collect a lot. I only want you to collect a little. Since you're only collecting a little bit of blood, I'm gonna have you modify that dipstick. I want you to cut off the tip so that the, um, the pad that is um, closest to the end is really the blood pad, because that's what I'm really interested in. So they're gonna cut that off because they're only gonna get a small amount of urine. They're gonna put it in the collection 
remember they're going to tap that pad or at least turn it on its side so that the excess urine uh, drips off because we don't want the color of the other pads to interfere with the blood pad. And then we're going to wait that 60 seconds. And you can see that that pad changes color. So it's very positive for blood. So it tells me it's in the bladder. So that's really good because when my animal comes to see me, I know that I'm going to have to pay a lot of attention to the bladder. I'm going to have to image the bladder more so than anything else. Now, if that blood was coming from the vagina, I know that an ultrasound and even an x-ray isn't going to help me. What's really going to be helpful is I'm probably going to have to do a, a vaginal palpation. So I have to prepare my owner to sedate for prepare their owner that I need to sedate the, the dog. Well, since I know it's in the, in the midstream, it's either coming from the um, anterior portion of the bladder. So after the dog empties all of its urine, it sort of squeezes its bladder. And so that's the reason why we see that. And when I do an ultrasound, you do see that the red arrow there points to a mass in the bladder. But when I look at the urethra, there's also a big mass expanding the urethra as well. So I could choose ultrasound even before the dog came to my clinic. So I would set that up ahead of time so that I would be more efficient with my examination and give my owner a heads up in terms of what to expect. That's application one. Let's look at application two. Which animal is peeing in the house? Now I'm gonna show you my own animals here. I have three dogs and one cat. They're really good dogs, but they all have urinary tract problems because that's how I get them. You see the cat here on the bottom. What I don't know is that in the middle of the night, one of my animals goes in the basement and urinates in the office in the basement. And I really thought it was the cat. But what I did is I got a, a motion, um, uh, a motion activated uh, night camera and I could tell right away who's doing it. So let's go ahead and take a look and see who's doing it. So in the middle of the night, my chihuahua jumps out of the bed and goes downstairs and urinates. So this was really important for me because the chihuahua was examined. It didn't have any problem with its urine, but the chihuahua is pretty old. So this was probably developing to a behavioral problem. And in order to make my uh, family happy, what we did is we put one of those male diapers on this dog. So at least we could um, control at least the, the urination in the house, but it didn't require any medical care. Let's go to our next application. Is inappropriate urination behavioral or medical? ML is a seven-year-old female spayed domestic short-haired cat who's urinating on the couch. Now, what do we know about the difference between medical and behavioral disease? Well, when you have feline inappropriate urination, medical problems, even if they're causing the behavioral problem, are more likely to have blood in them. And that's what you see here. You see a picture on the left of a, dog, of a cat who's spraying, but you know most cats shouldn't have blood in their spraying urine. The other one, on the other hand, looks like a normal behavioral thing. You wouldn't expect blood in it. Sometimes it can be in there, but it's just less likely to be present. So what I'm gonna have my owners do is something really important. What I'm gonna have them do is modify the litter pan. How am I gonna have them modify the litter pan? I'm gonna have them buy these um, blood detection pellets that they can put in the litter pan. And in addition to the blood detection pellets, what they really need to do, I'm going to go back here, is they also need to pull out that camera. And the reason why is if they have a multiple cat household, they want to be able to determine which cat is doing it. And so if the pellets don't change color, we know it's more likely to be a behavioral problem. Maybe the cat doesn't need to see me, it can see a behaviorist. But if they turn blue, that cat needs to come and see me and I, do, I need to do some medical imaging and at least a urinalysis to see if I can straighten out the underlying medical problem first. Now the reason why I tell my owners to do this is because the way we get urine is by cystocentesis. Sometimes by catheterization, rarely do we express the cat's bladder. Now the difficult thing about all of these good ways of collecting urine is they can cause blood. So actually what I tell my owners is that you're going to do a better job detecting blood at home than if you come and see me and come to my clinic because it's going to be more reliable. The other thing I tell owners to do is you can use this hydrophobic litter to collect urine samples, but it's really going to be important again to get that camera out. But I really don't encourage them to use this hydrophobic litter. And the reason why is if a cat has a behavioral problem, I don't want them to change the litter pan. That may make the behavioral problem worse. <clears throat> Let's look at application four. Is it diabetes? or kidney failure. 
Changes in urine volume can be a sign of disease. Um, sometimes the cause is a urinary tract problem and other times it's not. Well, the most common diseases that cause an increase in urine are gonna be either diabetes or kidney failure. Telling these diseases apart is really quite easy. Now, there may be a little bit of false positives and negatives, but for the most part, um, your tests are gonna be good. So this is what I tell owners in general anyway, especially if they have a cat. What you should be doing at every annual exam is you should pull out your smartphone and take a picture of the litter. And the reason why I tell them to do that is we can just put it in a file and every year we can pull it out and see how that um, urine volume is actually changing. And once it starts changing, you know we need to start evaluating the cat for diseases that show up as the cat gets older. An important thing, of course, is I try and have them pull out that um, night sensing or motion sensing night, act, uh, night uh, picturing camera. And the reason why is we, most of my feline um, clients, they have more than one cat. And I just wanna make sure that they put the right picture with the right cat. The other thing I have them do is I have them put some type of coin next to the little um, puddle. And the reason why I have them do that is because then we can measure that puddle and be a little bit more objective. Otherwise, if they take a picture too close, it'll look big, even though it's quite small. So it'll be important to, um, to, to do that as well. And the other reason why you want your camera is you want to go ahead and take that picture right away because um, if you, the, you can actually um, activate your camera to tell your smartphone that someone just went in the litter pan. And the reason why you want to do that is because some cats may bury their urine or may bury that puddle. And at least you'll be able to get a, a fresh sample right away. Now, if they're urinating a lot, that's going to be too much urine, and that's polyuria. And um, uh, sometimes it can be normal, but it's rare. I mean, if you're going to switch your cat to a lot of canned food or add water to the canned food, it may be normal to make a lot of urine. But if that's not what's occurring, and most of our cats eat a lot of dry food, you should expect a smaller puddle. Let's put what we've learned to work. TS is a 12-year-old male neutered domestic short hair with increased urine volume. Feline polyuria or increased volume is generally gonna be associated with diabetes. So you're gonna see glucose in the urine or renal failure, especially that older cat. Usually renal failure is quite common in cats that are um, greater than about 13 to 15 years of age. And as I mentioned before, there are a few other things, so it may require some other diagnostics later on, but at least if we can catch some of these bad diseases early, we'll have a better chance of treating them more appropriately and, and actually prolonging the life of our patients. Remember, you can detect glucose by looking at that urine strip. So that's what I'm gonna have owners do. But you know it's difficult to collect urine in a cat when it's voiding. So I'm going to have you do something differently. Remember those dipsticks? What I'd like you to do now is separate that glucose pad. So it's usually the pad closest to the, um, to the end. And what you want to do is take 10 of those pads, or maybe even more if you have a bigger litter pan. And what you want to do is cut out the, um, the part that detects glucose. And then after that, what you'd like to do is you'd like to go ahead and, and disperse it throughout the litter pan. Make sure the, litter, the, the pads for the detection are up because then you'll have a better chance that the urine will get them without them being contaminated um, by any part of the litter if they're turned upside down. And what you wanna do is you wanna again, put that motion activated camera near the litter pan. Not only do you wanna know which cat is doing it, but again, you want to activate that uh, camera to your cell phone so that when the camera detects motion in the litter pan, it'll send the client an, an activation so they can actually, and it'll actually send a picture as well. So two things they'll do, they'll know which cat actually urinated and they'll be able to go down relatively quickly to know if those dipsticks um, actually changed in color. Because if they sit there for a very long time, um, they may not be as reliable but if you pick them up early, they will. So here's the results of our cat. So you can see that our cat is positive for glucose in the urine. So more than likely our cat has um, diabetes, especially if um, the appetite is good and things like that. Because with a diabetic cat, especially when it's an early diabetic cat, 
actually their appetite may go up to sort of increase their calorie intake for losing it in their urine. Renal failure cats are a little bit different. They're older, they're getting thinner, and maybe their appetite will be a little bit more selective or certainly not increase. Um, so this is very helpful in terms of managing disease earlier. It'll actually avoid an emergency situation where the cat is ketotic and you have to worry about spending more money in your ER clinic. Again, here's just a close-up of what that looks like. It gives you an idea now that I've pulled out the scooper, actually how big that, that puddle is. Why that one strip didn't change color, I don't know. It's probably because urine didn't get on the top of it and the urine just spread along the bottom. But at least you have an idea of a, of a, positive, um, a positive test. It does require you seeing the cat and checking the blood glucose level as well. Um, so it'll be important because it will direct us in terms of the test that we want to do when the cat comes in. When it comes to the dog, sometimes I teach my um, owners to use a refractometer. It does require a little bit more work, um, so not everyone wants, wants to do that, but it is easy to read. It's not, a, it's not a big deal to sort of learn how to do it, and you can get refractometers online as well. The only thing I tell my, my clients is there are two types of refractometers. There's a medical one, and then there's also one to, um, um, to actually tell when your beer is ready and you don't want the one for making craft beer. And that's the reason why refractometers have decreased in price is because now um, people who make craft beer, uh, they need a refractometer. It's just that their values are different. Let's look at application five. Application five is where is the blood coming from? So these videos have really helped me out in terms of managing my patients. So GD is an eight-year-old male neutered golden retriever dog with hematuria. I'm going to play the movie and let you see what happens. We can get a lot of information from that video. So let me test your knowledge. What can we conclude from watching this video? Is the blood coming from the urinary bladder? What do you think? Does this dog have hemolytic anemia? That's another question for you to think about. And diagnostically, do we need a coagulation test to determine the underlying cause? Well, if you're up on hematuria, the answer to all three of those questions is no. You, it's not coming from the bladder. My dog was not dysuric. He does not have hemolytic anemia because you wouldn't see any clots. And because we see clots, I know that this dog did not get into rat poisoning or any other type of anticoagulant. That's actual blood. And because it's so much blood, it's probably coming from the kidney. So that tells me that when that dog comes to see me, I'm gonna to have to set up an ultrasound to look at the kidney. So let's take a look at the kidney. So this is what the kidney looked like on ultrasound. And for those of you who do ultrasound, you can see that this is very disorganized. That's not a normal kidney. A normal kidney is quite symmetrical in its architecture. And this is quite asymmetrical in its architecture. That dog went to surgery, we removed the kidney, Histopathological evaluation of samples from that kidney revealed that this dog had hemangiogenic sarcoma. So the dog didn't live very long. We did stop the bleeding for a short while, but what you know about this disease is by the time we make the diagnosis, it has already spread. In fact, it's a disease of blood vessels. And so, you know, with all the blood vessels in the body of the dog, um, it's something we couldn't stop just by removing the kidney or even with chemotherapy. Let's summarize a few things. In this time of COVID, keep yourself safe and your animals healthy with these tips. Urinary obstruction is an emergency, so that's when they need to be seen. Communicate effectively by videotaping your pet in action. Not only your pet, but the urine stain and the size of the urine puddle. And number three is hematuria is a common sign of urinary tract disease that is more reliably detected at home than at the veterinary clinic. So if your clients follow these helpful tips during their next visit to the vet, it will save time, save money, and achieve a quicker and more accurate diagnosis leading to more effective therapy.